You're listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. You're listening to IRN, 2014 Border Zone, International UFO Conference. All right, here we go again. In 1974, something very strange happened in the desert about 40 miles from where we sit today. Witnesses say an alien spacecraft crashed in midair with a small plane and fell to Earth just north of here. Nitorus and Ruben Urate have written two books about this famous case. In 2007, they released their first book, Mexico's Roswell, which led to many television documentaries and appearances by the authors. A second edition of the book was published in 2009. And just last year, the authors updated the story in their newest book, The Kayami Incident, UFO Crash near Presidio, Texas. Today, Noe and Ruben will bring us a complete story of what happened, including all the latest data about the reported crash of a UFO in the desert not far from here. Please help me welcome Noe Torres and Ruben Urarte. Thank you, Dennis. One of the joys that Ruben and I had in going to Roswell and speaking at the Roswell UFO Festival every summer for five years in a row was meeting many of the top UFO researchers in the world, really, including Dennis Balthaser. So that's one of the things, Dennis, that I have the greatest memories of is in, you know, and, and, uh, I so fondly remember is meeting you and the others, Stanton Friedman, Bruce Maccabee, just an innumerable number of wonderful folks that we met in Roswell. So that's how we got started. Uh, we, we put this book together, which we're going to be talking about now, Ruben and I, and um, then the phone started ringing off the wall, you know, and, and in our pockets as well. Um, the phone started ringing that George Norrie from Coast to Coast wanted to interview us. The History Channel wanted to do a documentary. And so it was like Katie bar the door, you know. What did we do? So anyway, the story is compelling. It is one of the most interesting and yet least known UFO cases um, now, in the popular literature, or in the UFO literature, I should say, the researchers call it Mexico's Roswell. And that's how it became to be known in the late 80s, early 90s, when the incident first surfaced. But it actually happened, as we've mentioned several times, not far from where we are here today. It happened in the Chihuahuan Desert, just about 40 miles northwest of here as the, as the crow flies. Uh, so uh, Presidio is actually one of the nearest populated cities, and certainly the nearest city on the Texas side to where this happened. And it's called the Coyame Incident because it happened in El Municipio de Coyame, the, the municipality of Coyame, which is would be the equivalent of a county in the U.S., so in the county of Coyame. Now, the county of Coyame in Mexico is a huge place, and I I believe one of the slides will show you the boundaries. But um, one of the earliest depictions of what happened out there, and, and I always show it at the beginning of our presentation because it gives a good capsule summary, about five minutes it, it summarizes the whole story, and it's from uh, an episode of UFOs of the 1970s, which aired on the History Channel. And keep an eye out while you watch this clip for my sidekick, Ruben, who's going to appear several times, and then he'll have more to, to tell you about that later. But anyway, here we go with the... The thing that kind of got the whole thing drop kicked and started, and here it is. August 25, 1974. Coyami, Mexico is home to its own mysterious, and some say lethal UFO incident. It is a place not found on many maps. 
and is home to more agave plants than people. But several of those who do live here claim the following event is real. It's a quiet summer's night in Koyami. The town's inhabitants are beginning to turn in for the night. 500 miles away, United States air defense systems suddenly register an unknown object flying over the Gulf of Mexico. Streaking across the sky at over 2,500 miles per hour at an altitude of 75,000 feet. Only one thing is for certain. This is not something man-made. Initial indications are that it's probably nothing more than a meteor. But 60 seconds later, it becomes clear that's impossible. This object was traveling and descending through steps, unlike that of a meteor again, it was more of an arc. The object appears headed on a course towards Corpus Christi, Texas. American air defense systems are alerted. Suddenly, the unidentified flying object veers left and enters Mexican airspace, just 40 miles south of Brownsville, Texas. The U.S. continues tracking the puzzling spacecraft as it now races over Mexico. Yet what isn't seen on radar is a small craft headed on a trajectory towards the UFO. What's also interesting about this case is about the same time as this UFO was zigging and zagging, there was a plane that was leaving El Paso headed towards Mexico City. The small civilian plane from El Paso heads towards Mexico's capital city, but never reaches its destination. At the same time, the American military watches as their unidentified flying object disappears from radar. It appears that the unthinkable has happened. There's an assumption that there was a collision of some type where uh, both the craft and the plane had collided. The following morning, nine hours after the civilian plane disappeared over the desert, a Mexican recovery team hunts for the downed craft. Across the border, American intelligence listens in. The Americans intercept a Mexican military radio report. The wreckage of the missing plane has been spotted just outside Koyami. Moments later, another report shockingly announces the sighting of a second wreck. But this is no plane. The Mexican recovery team finds a sort of a silver-shaped classic disc, some 16 feet 5 inches, about 5 feet thick, convex on both sides, sort of like a saucer. The saucer's surface has the appearance of polished steel. It has no markings, no lights, and there are no bodies inside. However, it does appear to be damaged in two spots, possibly caused by a collision with the civilian plane, and then falling to the ground. Immediately, Mexican officials declare radio silence on all search activities. Meanwhile, U.S. officials reach out to the Mexican government, offering assistance in the recovery. Their offer is met with a denial. The Mexican government denied it. They said, no, all we have is just a plane wreckage. While the Mexican team collects the crash debris, the United States is busy assembling their own elite recovery force at Fort Bliss, Texas. The team includes four helicopters, three small Hueys, and a large sea stallion. The team is placed on standby while U.S. surveillance scopes out the situation. The U.S. was keeping taps again through its uh, spy, well, what I call the spy surveillance network, um, through their satellite uh, surveillance as well as uh, airplanes that were flying over at low altitude. American surveillance reveals that the Mexicans have placed the UFO on a flatbed truck and moved from the crash site. Then some say satellite photos were taken that reveal a startling discovery. The Mexican convoy has stopped and something has gone wrong. We were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, which led them to believe that something extraordinary had happened. U.S. officials greenlight their rescue team. Four helicopters to Park Fort Bliss. One of the things that seems obvious in this case is that, that 
the government, the U.S. government, responded very expertly, very quickly and very organized. They had this team that assembled in Fort Bliss and in no time were down there on site recovering this. They've done this before. But nothing will prepare the Americans for what they are about to find. Dressed in bioprotection suits, the American soldiers approach the silent convoy and find all the Mexicans dead. There is no time to investigate what killed the Mexican team, but UFO researchers have their theories. They somehow came in contact with a, uh, a lethal agent, a bacteriological agent that was um, from out of this world or an extraterrestrial biological agent of some sort that killed them, uh, which is my favorite theory. The U.S. recovery team quickly tends to business. It finds the 16-foot-wide silver UFO strapped to the back of a flatbed truck. The straps are reconfigured and connected to a cargo cable from the Sea Stallion helicopter. Safely secured, the estimated 1,500-pound disc is lifted up and headed back to the U.S. With the saucer gone, the team immediately turns their attention to the remaining evidence. The plane wreckage, vehicles from the convoy, and Mexican team bodies are gathered. They gather the debris, the bodies from the Mexican recovery team, and then they exploded them with high explosives. The reason why is to hide the evidence. Their work done, the recovery team heads back to base. Where the UFO was taken is unknown. Some have speculated Atlanta, Fort Bliss, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. If this 1974 UFO crash was real, there was no evidence to prove it. Okay, and that's how it all began. Fascinating story. And uh, although Ruben Uriarte and I wrote the first book about it and subsequently did several TV shows and have been on the radio a bunch of times and uh, followed up with two more books about it, we weren't the ones who originated the story. And so we're going to start off tonight. I'm going to give you an overview of where the story came from. So we're going to go with that. Uh, the first printed record of this incident actually occurred in a very interesting document by one of the pioneering UFO researchers in North America, Leonard Stringfield. Uh, Leonard Stringfield was one of the first UFO investigators who proposed the concept that there most likely had been UFO crashes. You know, he started talking about UFO crashes before Roswell, the Roswell incident became known, and before anybody much was talking about anything other than lights in the sky. You know, there were occasional uh, close encounters of the third kind, like Betty and Barney Hill in the early 60s, but for the most part, until Leonard Stringfield came along, very little attention had been paid to, hey, this stuff could crash. These people are not gods. They are not somehow immune from having accidents. Uh, accidents such as in the example of Roswell, it's believed that there was a, a lightning strike during an intense lightning storm out in the desert that brought the craft at Roswell down. Uh, in other cases, the U.S. military has been it has been suggested the military brought some of these craft down. So anyway, Stringfield's philosophy was these objects are seen all over the planet. It's likely that some of them have crashed. And some of these stories about UFOs crashing and material being retrieved are probably true. Well, this is what Leonard Stringfield said um, in the late 1970s, early 80s, he said, in my judgment, there seems to be a legitimacy to the 1974 Chihuahua crash report. The Chihuahua report came to me from Elaine Douglas of Washington, D.C., who, by the way, was a major contributor to our first book, Mexico's Roswell, and wrote an entire section which we published word for word uh, from her. 
um, the late Elaine Douglas, who unfortunately passed away about a year and a half ago, Ruben? Uh, Approximately, yes. We were very sorry to hear about that. But anyway, the Chihuahua report was given from was given by Elaine Douglas, who received it in a mail in in her mail as an anonymous letter. It was given to um, pioneering crash retrieval researcher Leonard Stringfield um, in, 19, in July 1993. So receiving it in the mail in the summer of 1993, postmark Santa Ana, California, she said it came probably as a result of publicity following a, uh, a march that uh, Elaine's organization had done to promote the idea that the government should give up some of its top secret UFO files. So um, he goes on to say, and, and I'm going to skip to the last paragraph, one compelling reason I believe the report is worthy of space in this status report is based on my recollection that I heard of the Chihuahua case before, either in the late 1970s or early 1980s. So that's the reference that I was talking about that uh, Leonard Stringfield, who was very much into the crash retrieval research, had heard about Chihuahua as early as the late 1970s. The only detail I vaguely recall is that a U.S. military team had covertly crossed into Mexico to retrieve the object. Well, as we elaborate on this story, we find out that that covert intrusion into Mexico occurred approximately 40 miles from here. And it was a helicopter convoy out of Fort Bliss Army Base in El Paso. Uh, the helicopters came straight down the Rio Grande River on the Texas side until they got to the small community of Candelaria, which is just northwest of here. And uh, once they hit the northern outskirts of Candelaria, they cut into Mexico and went made straight for the UFO crash site. So this is just part of the Deneb report, which is about two pages long. And uh, this was what was received by mail uh, by Washington, D.C. UFO researcher Elaine Douglas. Now, this is very interesting. Two days before we left for to come here, I got a call from the lady who inherited or received all of the documents that Elaine had about UFOs. Uh, you know, after she died, they passed, they, they were passed along to her. So she's now the custodian of all of Elaine Douglas's materials. And Ru even Ruben doesn't know this. I was planning to surprise him about it. So I got a call t uh, about three days ago, two days before we left, and um, the lady who now holds all the documents told me we found several items pertaining to the Chihuahua UFO crash. And she sent me one of them. She scanned and emailed it to me. And Elaine had written little comments in the margins about how she thought this was a very interesting case and she needed to follow up on it. So it was something that was in her, in her thinking um, until the very end of her life. And... Um, Unfortunately, she developed breast cancer and, and lost her struggle with it. Otherwise, we might have found out more about this. So, uh, as I mentioned, once Ruben and I, you know, started talking about this, and we, we actually, nobody had actually taken the Denov report that was received in the mail by Elaine and, and then later Leonard Stringfield. Nobody had actually taken that and traced it out and tried to find witnesses, tried to talk to people in the area where it supposedly happened. You know, nothing had been done along those lines until Reuben and I stumbled into the picture and uh, we, uh, we went down there by ourselves a couple of times to the Koyame area where this happened. Then the History Channel paid for us to go. We weren't about to turn down free trip there. And we did more research. And then um, we're hoping to go this coming summer for the tricentennial celebration. Um, as Dr. Morales mentioned this morning, 
the city of Koyame is having its tricentennial on June 20th, June 20th, 24th, June 24th. And they're going to have a festival and music. And they're also invited Reuben and me uh, because we have represented their town well, uh, apparently, uh, in the media and in books. And we're going to be speaking there. So this story has been covered. Um, these are just a few of where it's been covered. Uh, UFO Files did an episode in 2007. UFOs of the 1970s, which you just watched a clip from, UFO Hunters, Larry King Live, um, Contacto Extraterrestre, which is a Spanish uh, History Channel show, and most recently, and I'm kind of embarrassed to mention this because they got a lot of the facts wrong, and uh, neither Ruben nor I were asked to contribute to it, but Hangar One. Um, also covered the Chihuahua crash. You had a comment, Ruben. Well, just wanted to uh, share with the audience that uh, both Noe and I have been working very extensively, too, with the Mexican investigators. Uh, there are several organizations in Chihuahua that have also have focused attention on this. So we've been collaborating information as well. In fact, right now they're having a UFO conference in the city of Chihuahua, and we and we in, 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 so we work together, but at the same time, we're trying to educate the public as to what are what's going on in this part of the country on, on both sides of the border. So it's been an interesting journey for us, and <clears throat> you, you'll soon uh, we'll share with you some of the interesting information that was passed down to us. And that's interesting, knowing about uh, Elaine Douglas the, those notes. I'm real excited about that. Since Ruben's birthday was last weekend, I wanted to give him a surprise birthday <laughs> present. New information about the case that even he didn't know about. I got new one to share with you. By the way, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> 50 now? You're 50? Oh, yeah, yeah. 50. Around 50. Keep going. All right, so we have books, many books. Everybody has jumped on it. After Ruben and I published Mexico's Roswell in 2007, We've had, uh, of course, we did a second edition. Uh, we did the Koyama UFO incident, which is our latest book, because there was so much new information and there were so many other witnesses that had come forward, so we totally redid the story in the Koyama incident. Then Kevin Randall jumped in and Bill Burns and a whole bunch of other people. So it's been mentioned in quite a number of books. Um, so the story is out there, and uh, a lot of people talking about it, most of them refer to the original document, but nobody has actually been down there and spoken to people, you know. Um, so Ruben and I still think that it was pretty cool to have been the primary original people who followed up on what had previously only been kind of a rumor. Um. As a result of the research that we've been doing, one of the things that we started to find out was this wasn't the only uh, crash that had occurred along the border. We came across other cases, the historical cases, and we have another one that happened in Del Rio in 1955, another case that happened near Laredo in 1948. So this is what's interesting is the more research we dig into, and we're, we're fi finding a trail. So we uh, are, this is a de detective story, and there's more coming together on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now here's the latest twist regarding our story. Um, we've been contacted by a lady who writes screenplays, and her name is Ana Maria Lisa Manalo. And she is currently working on a script. With our permission, we signed an agreement to turn our book, The Koyame Incident, into a major motion picture screenplay. So um, the story will be fictionalized. I'll say that right at, the, right at the top. As happens a lot of times with Hollywood motion pictures, and David can attest to this, um, the reality or the truth of what actually happened really isn't sufficient to draw audiences and to make money for the movie makers. 
So some elements of fiction will be introduced. Case in point, Fire in the Sky, the movie about Travis Walton's experience. Uh, many others, uh, even the Roswell, the Roswell, um, Roswell the movie, which was very faithful to the Roswell incident story, but it did include some, some uh, fictionalized material as well. Um, for instance, Jesse Marcel never actually attended a reunion of the 509th bomb wing, as is depicted at the beginning of the movie. Uh, so anyway, uh, this new screenplay, uh, the elements of the Koyame UFO story will be, will be there, but there will be elements of fiction as well. Of course, as David has pointed out to us, just because you have a screenplay doesn't mean anything will ever be done with it. And um, it's, it's, you know, it, it could someday take off or not. I know Stanton Friedman has a couple of his books that have been in the process of becoming movies for many years. And, of course, he's one of the world's leading authorities on UFOs, so... So everything starts with a UFO sighting off the Texas Gulf Coast, radar stations along the Gulf Coast of Texas around Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi Naval Air Station, detected this object that was traveling at over 2,000 miles per hour originally and at about 75,000 feet in altitude. It began slowing down, it began dropping in altitude, to about 45,000 feet, and it came down under 2,000 miles per hour. And it made, if you'll notice on this map, it made kind of a 90 degree angle turn. First seemed to be headed toward south of Corpus, just south of Kingsville, dropped down, and then down here made another 90 degree angle turn and cut into Mexico. So that is your route that was followed. The object then streaked across some of the least populated areas of northern Mexico, with the possible exception of coming very close to Nuevo Laredo, right in here. But mostly it seemed to shy away from populated areas. Uh, during its run, it went through an area of Mexico known as the Zona del Silencio, which is not far from here. That's an area of Mexico that's been called Mexico's Bermuda Triangle because com compasses will spin wildly, radio communications will fail, the instrumentation on airplanes that are overflying the area will suddenly go out of control, and uh, there have been numerous UFO sightings in that area of Mexico throughout the year. So that's the Zona del Silencio, which is kind of south of where we are today. And the right about here... Um, you know, Del Rio's around here, and then uh, right around there, the um, it disappeared from... I'm sorry, Del Rio's over here. Presidio's here. And then um, there was this mid-air collision between the two objects because they suddenly, both objects that had been tracked on radar uh, were disappearing. All right, this was a slide I hoped I had put in here. There were... There were three long-range radar sites in 1974 that you see listed here. And so the tracking capabilities were good. And that's how uh, the progress of the objects were being uh, followed. And what about the, the plane that it crashed into? Well, we know that it was a small plane, and it came out of El Paso International Airport. Uh, people always ask us if there was any sort of information that's been found on who was the airplane owner or operator or who were the passengers, and the answer is no. We don't know if that information disappeared subsequently in some sort of cover-up or the other um, possibility that has been brought forward is that the plane was involved in some kind of illegal activity, perhaps drug trafficking, and they didn't want to be, you know, they wanted to have as little information about them known as possible. So we don't know. But one interesting thing we did find out is that uh, small planes carrying contraband, such as illegal drugs, 
uh, was a common occurrence in this area. Um, it, was, it happened frequently in the 70s and even afterward. So there is that possibility that that could have been a drug-related, drug-running plane. Did you have a comment, Ruben? Or, okay. So where did exactly did this happen? Well, the area of the crash is shown on this map. Here's Presidio. Here's a small community of uh, Koyame. And then the here's Candelaria, by the way. And right in here is the area of the crash, um, as close as we can figure, based on the trajectory of both both uh, craft, as mentioned in the Denim report, and talking to witnesses out here in the Chihuahuan Desert, and talking to observers from Candelaria, who we'll be talking more about in a few minutes. We estimate the area of the crash could be anywhere within this shaded circle, possibly somewhere near the center of it. So that's quite a distance away from Koyame. It's probably as close to the town as Koyame as it is to Presidio and Ojinaga. So, you know, it's called the Koyame incident, but once again, uh, that refers to the to the county, or as they call it in Mexico, municipality of Koyame, which is a huge area. So Brad in Black, our wonderful host for this series, uh, got up in a plane and took pictures, quite the photographer, and uh, this is the area of the crash of the mid-air collision we suspect. Um, how was it to fly up there, Brad? Did, was it a good experience for you? Um, It says it was fun. Uh, it was just a regular plane flight, and and he took he took some real nice pictures. Was it a problem getting permission from the Mexican authorities to overfly? Flew along the river, flew along the river, and they took uh, photography from the river. Okay. So uh, here's a composite of two of the pictures Brad took, and. Um, you've got this area where we suspect the collision occurred and the wreckage was later found by the Mexican authorities and then taken over by the U.S. authorities. And one more slightly different view. So what's really interesting is we talked to people who, live, who were living out in these ranches around here. And a couple of them uh, told us that in 1974, around this time, although they didn't remember the exact time, there was a huge explosion in the night. Uh, one gentleman told us that the windows in his home rattled and he thought they had broken. Uh, he also talked about many UFO sightings that he himself had, had made note of. He showed us this notebook, both before and after, but in particular after this 1974 incident because it was it made him stand up and take notice that there's something weird going on there. So the interesting thing was that Reuben and I wandered around the desert. I, I tell Reuben our desert wandering <laughs> period. So we wandered around the desert. We talked to people. We visited uh, potential eyewitnesses. We had never done anything on the U.S. side. So and then and then we caught a big break a couple of years ago, which we're going to talk about, because we had actual eyewitnesses from the Texas side of the Rio Grande. Anything you want to add at this point, Ruben? Oh, just that the that area that we went into, we uh, went uh, with, a, with a guide who was familiar with, with, with that area, and there's many roads, and as Noe had mentioned, many ranches, and, and so it was... Uh, Again, it was very interesting just meeting certain people. And it's a very isolated area, as you know, living in, on this side of the border. There's just a lot of space. But over there is just a very beautiful but very eerie type of landscape. So Ruben and I literally put our boots on the ground out in the Chihuahuan Desert. 
And with the rattlesnakes and scorpions that you encounter out on the desert, you want to have boots on. (laughs) So you have to be careful if you need to go out in the brush to take care of any business, too. So... (laughs) The Mexican soldiers out there after the crash reported a silver disc, as you heard in the video that introduced our talk. And these were the dimensions that are mentioned in the Deneb report. 16 feet, 5 inches in diameter, and 5 feet tall. There were two interesting points on the hull of the ship. There was a 12-inch jagged hull and there was a 24-inch diameter dent in the hull. Well, when we heard that the Mexican retrieval team that arrived had all died, perhaps as many as 24 soldiers, Ruben and I speculated that maybe there was something venting out of this open area in the hull. You know, maybe there was some kind of fume, chemical, you know, who knows what kind of propulsion system. Perhaps something was venting out of that hole in the hull, and that might have caused all of the Mexican soldiers to perish. So that was one theory that we came up with. Uh, We're not completely certain. Maybe they were exposed to some type of radiation. We know radiation has been found. Traces of radiation have been found at UFO landing sites and in other UFO cases, so perhaps that. So uh, some of the most sophisticated listening and, well, spying is a harsh word, but okay, spying assets that the U.S. had in place or that anywhere in the world had in place were in El Paso, Texas. That was the big surveillance center Uh, for electronic surveillance in 1974. They had one of the most sophisticated setups in the world. And it appears that they were focusing in on what was going on right across the river from them. And what they were hearing was a downed aircraft, and then they heard a report that when the Mexican soldiers arrived at the scene to try to determine where the plane had crashed, they found another object that they were not expecting. So apparently all of this was being listened to on the U.S. side. And so we have what's known in in UFO research as a rapid response team that was put together. Uh, Many UFO researchers believe that there are teams from personnel who go through their daily routines every day of their lives in various aspects of military service and intelligence community service. And, but if an, when an incident happens, these individuals are immediately brought together at a certain location and dispatched to the scene of one of these incidents. And one of the persons that strongly, uh, you know, she saw all of the she saw all of the aspects of a rapid response team being having taken care of this incident it was Elaine Douglas, um, who had actually talked to some members of rapid response teams, although they couldn't go on the record and they wouldn't give her precise information about specific cases. But she talked to one of them. She met one of them clandestinely in Washington, D.C. at a small cafe, And that person verified that this had all the markings of a CIA rapid response UFO team. So what they did was they put together a helicopter team, which included one cargo helicopter, which could have been a super stallion or a sea knight, something similar to that, and then some Hueys to provide cover for them and transport additional personnel. I don't know if you all are aware, but Fort Bliss in El Paso is one of the largest military compounds in the world. It extends from the downtown area of El Paso all the way into New Mexico, where it adjoins with the uh, White Sands Missile Range. So, I mean, that is a huge swath of land. Um, 
There are some areas of Fort Bliss that personnel who, who actually are stationed there have never ever seen. They only see a small section of the base. The rest of it, there are landing fields, there are hangars. Nobody knows what's out there. Well, somebody knows, but we don't know. So, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the first to be dispatched out to the scene was a, a squadron of Mexican soldiers, up to 24, and they all perished due to unknown causes. Um, it's kind of inelegant to say this, but this is what the dinner report says, and that is that when the U.S. team later arrived, they gathered the Mexican bodies and the debris from the crashed airplane, and they exploded it. They exploded all the remaining evidence. So, essentially, we're just telling you what the Denim Report says. And uh, it's interesting is that the soldiers from Mexico did not have any sort of hazmat gear, bioprotection gear. They were totally unprepared. They thought they were going out to deal with a, the crash of a small plane. And upon arrival, it was only upon arrival that they encountered this other craft, which they knew nothing about and were not prepared. And not that the Mexican military would have had much in the way of biohazard gear back in the 70s, Anyway, so, and once again, we've heard from UFO researchers who suggest that when an incident like this happens in other countries, the U.S. is often invited to come in and take care of the mess because it requires specialized personnel and specialized equipment to deal with what happens at a crashed UFO site. You do something wrong and you die if you're a member of one of these retrieval teams. We talked to a gentleman in Roswell who has told us that he was on a crash retrieval team. He was working with a buddy inside of a crash saucer, and they were talking, you know, back and forth, and his buddy leaned over and apparently pressed a button, and he was gone, vaporized in a second. They found nothing of his remains. So... Um, it does take specialized skills, a specialized skill set and specialized equipment to deal with something like this. So Ruben and I actually wrote the original article about the Koyama UFO incident on Wikipedia. And uh, hot, uh, block your ears on this, Melanie. I know you're not a Wikipedia fan. And a lot of Wikipedia stuff is kind of suspect. But I felt that our article about the Koyama incident was fairly strong. In fact, that's why we wanted to introduce it. And it was on there for a couple of years, but then the, the great minds that control Wikipedia said, because Ruben and I had written a book and we were making money, we were not qualified to give an impartial report for Wikipedia. So they took it off. They took our work off. But before they took it off, we had an interesting incident happen. We had someone post some anonymous information and try as Ruben and I might, we could never determine the source. The guy was slippier, slipperier, can't say that word, but he was slippery. Mm -hmm. He was very slippery and he gave us a slip. Wikipedia would not tell us who his identity, that's their privacy policy, neither would he tell us his identity. We did everything we could think of, in, including offering him to send us copies of our book, which he saw through right away. If we send him copies of, of our book, then we know where he is, right? So he said no. Uh, we didn't know who he was. We suspect he probably was in the military or had ties to someone in the military who was familiar with this case. Because what he posted opened our eyes. He gave the names of specific soldiers and the serial numbers of soldiers who perished in the Koyama incident, both on the Mexican side and on the U.S. side. Now, 
we had never had access to that information and we've written three books about it. Their bodies displayed signs of death by asphyxiation. They were also in possession of their firearms but showed no evidence of attempting, attempting to use them. Now Reuben and I kind of scratched our heads and we talked to our counterparts in Mexico, UFO researchers in Mexico, and they felt that these serial numbers were actually in the right format for Mexican military. And these names certainly sound like Mexican soldiers, you know. So it was an interesting break in the case. Uh, they've been trying to follow up in Mexico and they've come up with what they think might be the people involved and then something weird happens and it turns out that they weren't. So it's still a developing story. This was also from the unconfirmed anonymous posting on Wikipedia. We had never heard this information before that the recovery team sent to Koyame from Fort Bliss consisted of 15 men. Well, we never had a source for 15 men. It wasn't in the Denev report. Elaine Douglas, Leonard Stringfield didn't have a number. So where did this information come from? Every time I tried to contact the guy who posted this on Wikipedia, he, he ran circles around me. He was evasive. He was, he kept, I would ask him a question and he would ask the same question back to me. I mean, this, if this guy didn't have some kind of intelligence training, I, I'll eat my hat. I don't have a hat, but... Anyway, uh, so they named names. The American group included Captain Lawrence Mar Murley, Lieutenant Randall Bishop, etc. All retired U.S. Armed Forces personnel. The group entered Mexico surreptitiously after interception of a Mexican radio communication giving away the location of the crash site. Once again, all data that we never had until somebody went on Wikipedia and posted this information. Well, what better place to put it if you've got information, you want it, you want people to know it, and yet you want to remain anonymous because the people who post to Wikipedia do not have to give their real identities. So why is the small community of Candelaria, is it, uh, why is it a key? Well, one of the first times we came down here, we went up to Candelaria and we looked around. There isn't much on the Texas side. Nobody from Candelaria here, right? So there's a broken down old saloon at an inner, at a stoplight and that's it. I mean, if you miss that, you've missed Candelaria. But as I had mentioned earlier, um, this is where the recovery team from Fort Bliss which had the helicopters had followed the course of the Rio Grande River all the way down from El Paso and just north of Candelaria they cut across and went straight to the crash site. So we took that picture that you were just looking at right about here and then they, they cut straight across. So of course the story goes that the CIA recovery team which included ex-military personnel and possibly some personnel trained in handling hazardous materials, that they, uh, when they arrived at the scene, lo and behold, the Mexican recovery team members were dead, already dead. But there was no involvement on our part in their deaths. They were already dead. Possibly uh, something from the UFO had killed them. So. Uh, and we do know, that, as I mentioned earlier, that being around a UFO crash site can be dangerous, but what really happened, we don't know. We just have what the Denver report says, which is that they were all dead. And so what did the U.S. do? They took the remaining evidence at the site, and as the big cargo helicopter took off with, with the UFO dangling from a line, most likely covered with a tarp or some kind of protection, it took off, left the area, and then the remaining evidence was gathered together in a big pile and exploded, either with high explosives or a small 
yield thermal nuclear device, which was in the protocol for dealing with possible contamination, areas of contamination. Did the Mexican government ever complain to the United Nations or to the people like that they accepted the fact that we're going to have to Yeah, we will address that once we finish. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind. We always do touch on that, though. But remind us in case we forget. So the UFO evidence was removed, the soldiers exploded, the remaining evidence. We think in MK-54, we see the, we see the hallmarks of a low-yield nuke, like the CIA uh, had in its arsenal an MK-54, which would do the job very nicely and affect a minimal area in terms of ecological impact, impact to the environment or to surrounding life. It just is a pinpoint boom, and you've cleansed the area of any possible contaminants. So that's why we suspect that, and we caught a break, as I mentioned earlier, when one of the most respected educators in this part of Texas, Mrs. Johnny Mitchell, uh, I'm sorry, Johnny Chambers, uh, and her son, uh, step forward when they heard we were having our first UFO festival and that it had something to do with a UFO that had crashed near here. They stepped forward and said, we saw an explosion in the sky directly across the Rio Grande River from Candelaria in 1974. Boom, just like that. It hit us like that blast. It was just a big explosion in the sky, she told us, mostly round. I can see it in my mind, but it is hard to describe. I would say the width of it was about four or five miles, and of course it was pretty high in the sky. And her son, who was uh, 10 years old in 1974, uh, told us all of a sudden a big old glow, fireball-looking thing. Sorry about that. Apple wants some more money from me, but they're not going to get it right now. All of a sudden, a big old glow, fireball-looking thing, appeared over the mountain over there. We stopped and watched it for a while. It was quite a fireball. So, um, here is Rio Dosa. Here is Candelaria. We're in Presidio down here. And this is where uh, the chambers were both driving in their vehicle, coming down a mountain from the hot springs. And they were looking this way, and suddenly the pieces started coming together because this was the location we had pinpointed seven years ago. The very location that we had pinpointed seven or eight years ago, based on the Denim report, they were directly across the Rio Grande River from that location, directly. So we had one of those wow moments when... That was a big wow. Big that was a big wow. And last, let's see, last year or... No, it was two years ago, we had the Chambers present, you know, part of our presentation. Um, Mrs. Chambers, however, doesn't uh, do mo travel much anymore. She's... Uh, elderly and so uh, they saw what they described as a four to five mile wide fireball come up over the mountains there's mountains on the Mexican side and they were over they were standing right here or not they were in their car they, at one point they did get out of their car and stand outside the car and they saw this huge fireball right actually right back here in El Llano, the area known as El Llano. Now here's a picture we went out to the site at last year's UFO festival and we took a picture of the actual place where John Chambers, the son, took us to the actual place where he and his mom were standing and looking uh, this was a road that they were traveling on, coming back down to Candelaria. And right over these mountains, they saw the fireball. I did a computer simulation. Uh, I showed it to Mrs. Chambers, and she said, 
How did you get a picture of it? I took one of the uh, nuclear tests that we did in the 60s. I took a picture of one of the nuclear tests from the 60s and superimposed it, uh, photoshopped it in behind the very place where they saw the fireball. And she was just stunned. In fact, we gave her a copy of this print autographed by us, and she really appreciated that. We watched it all the way down the mountain, I imagine at least five or more, five or maybe ten minutes more. We did not keep driving at regular speed. We slowed down and kept watching it. Then he described that it had colors in it. Um, it was orange and red, fire red, blazing red. Uh, not, not really red, but it had some orange in it. It did not move up or down. It stayed up there for quite a while. Well, you know, what? All, reading all the descriptions of people who have witnessed nuclear explosions, it, it sounds just like that. We thought it was a fire. We had seen fires many times, but it was not like that. It was a different kind of glow. It was almost like the sun coming back up. Now, that really struck me. I had read that quote before in a book, and that was in the book The Sun uh, Rises, uh, The Sun Rose Twice, about the uh, the first nuclear tests that were done, um, and the fireball seemed like it was the sun rising again. So that that really made an impact on me. So anyway, uh, they knew it was a plane crash. They knew it wasn't a forest fire. They knew it was something different. And Now, another uh, part of the story, and we're going to have to wrap it up shortly, but another part of the story is that the helicopters came across the U.S. Uh, boundary with Mexico uh, on their way to the crash site. And then when they recovered the material and they loaded up all the soldiers again, they came back across. Well, the chambers told us that within a day after they saw the strange glow in the sky, several area residents observed a group of military helicopters moving back into the U.S. from Mexico, including one large twin rotor helicopter. It was several, maybe three or four, he said. Now, I need to point out to you that the chambers live in a very isolated part. Uh, of the area and they have no interest in UFOs they had never heard about our book they had heard that we were having a UFO festival and that was the first you know they didn't associate it with what they saw they did you know we had to really struggle to get the story out of them they really have no desire for publicity but um, and they have no interest in UFOs. They just saw something strange in the sky and it happened to be on the very date at the very place where we think this incident happened. So we, uh, we had, uh, and we don't have time unfortunately to show this, but we went up there with John Chambers a year ago and he showed us, he pointed out the mountain ridge where this incident happened. And uh, so um, we suspect that the crash debris was taken to Atlanta, Georgia, the reason being that there was obviously a contaminant or something that was affecting, that had killed the soldiers, and so it needed to be analyzed. The world's leading facilities for dealing with a threat of a biological um, nature was at the CDC in Atlanta. And then we've heard from other witnesses who have additional information that we have um, uncovered. There's a series of coincidences that have been uncovered, and they're all in our latest book. And uh, which is the Koyama incident, and we've got copies available. Uh, our first book, Mexico's Roswell, we also have a few. Um, if, by the grace of Dennis, can we take a couple of questions? <laughs> All right. Dennis is going to let us take a couple of questions. Yes, sir. The, the names that God was able to put up on, on, on the media for you, and uh, the 
The question is, the, the names that appeared mysteriously on the Wikipedia posting giving the names of soldiers who died in this incident, has anybody ever checked? Actually, the answer is people are checking right now. Because this hasn't been, uh, this wasn't known until just a short time ago. Recent, yeah. It's very recent. And other questions? The question about the Mexican government. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> This isn't something that government officials in Mexico really strongly believe really happened. They think it's kind of like part of UFO lore. So possibly it hasn't been taken seriously, because if it had been taken seriously, this would be a major in international incident and in the U.S., you know, even though it was, you know, where this location happened was within maybe 15 miles of the international boundary, but even so, it did happen in Mexican territory. Uh, but the, the, the only answer we have at the time being is that it's not really taken seriously, probably, because they don't have all the facts and information yet. After they read our book, though, they, they might <laughs> think twice about that. There was one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about. There happened to have been a major crash. Uh, they reported it as a crash of military vehicles who were just on a routine convoy, and a whole bunch of Mexican soldiers died. So they just reported it as a highway crash, and it happened, it was reported at that t same time period. So you never know. A cover story is put out there. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, the of the, of the who were involved, the yes. Uh -huh. uh, the of the that were working with the CIA and all this kind of stuff, bring out new military. Right? That's right. And That's a good point. That's a very good point, and, and the observation is that obviously, and we've suspected this from the beginning, that the people involved in the U.S. recovery team were not active military. This was a CIA operation. They were operative. Some of them were ex-military, but they had ways to cover their tracks, and there's nothing within the military that's traceable because the military was really marginally involved. And I think we have to cut it. We'll be available at our table. He's loaded, giving us one more. Yes, sir. That's a very good question. When we went with the History Channels, the question is, is there, could there be some radiation out in the Koyama crash area? Yes, it's possible. When we went with the History Channels, we found a site that we think is related where somebody dug a vertical pit that goes down a long, long distance, and there were airplane parts all around it. And um, when, when they stuck the, the um, detector, the radiation detector, one of the crew members with the History Channel stuck his arm down there just a little ways down, and the thing started spiking. The meter started spiking. So he pulled his arm back real quick. So could there be radiation in the area? It's possible. We've also heard, and we didn't have a chance to elaborate on this, but there's an area in the approximate area there. There's a place where nothing grows. And it's well known to people who, are, who live in the area, who ranch in the area, that this is a dead zone. Nothing grows there. And that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for putting up with us. You're listening to IRN, 2014 Border Zone International UFO Conference.